thank you very much for that kind introduction it is always wonderful to talk at this conference particularly dr bansi has been like the superstar of indian diabetes he has helped us and guided all of us into growing up into what we would consider the next generation of doctors looking after patients with diabetes in india when he first gave me the topic i thought he had asked me to speak on diabetes and thyroid disorder and then i read that he had put a twist to it that it's diabetes and hyperthyroidism so i shall talk about it in as brief a manner as possible because i understand this session is supposed to finish with question answers at 2:30 pm so when we talk about diabetes and thyroid whether it's hypo or hyperthyroid we are essentially talking of double trouble we have two sets of problem and it's important to remember that the word thyroid diabetes was coined even before the use of the word insulin so people knew that thyroid disorders could actually lead to diabetes that means diabetes secondary to hyperthyroidism was already described even before insulin was discovered so that's the outline of my talk i'll talk a little bit about the epidemiology the pathophysiological link the basic relationship between the thyroid hormones and glucose homeostasis how to interpret blood test reports and what complications of diabetes and thyroid disorders go hand in hand certain bits about the clinical characteristics and management of this concurrent problem i'll try to be as brief as possible because we are running short of time so if you look at these two problems i think i earn 90% of my professional learnings from seeing people with thyroid disorders or with diabetes as an endocrinologist both of these are very common diseases they have major impact of thyroid disorder on glucose metabolism both hypo and hyperthyroidism might actually alter the way you manage diabetes diabetes incidentally also has certain effects on the thyroid function so when we are talking about glucose control and hyperthyroidism there are effects on the carbohydrate metabolism and this problem of hyperthyroidism can happen both in type 1 and type 2 and the glycemic control seems to worsen if you have hyperthyroidism now in terms of the epidemiology this is there's a lot about what the western world talks about i'm not going to talk about it much but it says that about 1.3% of the american population has hyperthyroidism we were fortunate to work with dr v mohan's team of the icmr in diab study in my state of west bengal we just finished the study in addition to his bit of the study of diabetes and other metabolic diseases we've actually looked at 43 endocrine parameters in the population of west bengal and i have preliminary data of the thyroid disease which is less than 0.2% so about 0.2% of people in india probably have a thyroid disorder and about anywhere between 13 to 20% of our population has diabetes so that's the kind of problem that we are talking about in terms of hyperthyroidism now the if you look at data particularly if you're looking at type 1 diabetes they are much more likely to have a thyroid dysfunction as compared to a type 2 diabetic individual i'll talk about our own local data as well and all of this particularly in type 1 there seems to be a very strong association of the autoimmune thyroid disease with gad antibody positive type 1 diabetes where thyroid dysfunction can happen up to 30% of the population in a much younger group of people and if type 1 children and young adolescents have hyperthyroidism it could very well precipitate a diabetic ketoacidosis so if i can kind of summarize the western data i'm talking about that autoimmune thyroid disease can happen up to 30% of individuals with type 1 diabetes that's because of the autoimmune background this will happen more in women those with antibody positive and as the disease progresses and it's predominantly hypothyroidism and that often leads to poor control of blood glucose levels now this is our own data from our own institute where we looked at thyroid dysfunction in about 100 patients who had turned up on the world thyroid day in our diabetes clinic and like i said because i said the prevalence of hyperthyroidism is pretty low anywhere between 1% or 0.5% we did not pick up anybody on that day when we sampled 100 patients so of your patients with diabetes anticipate about 0.2 to 0.5% of your patients might have hyperthyroidism whereas if you look at <coughs> pregnant women thyroid dysfunction 
is of course much more common in GDM, particularly if you have, it's two and a half times more common in people without GDM as compared to those with GDM. This graph kind of tells the relationship the three four in individuals who are showing us there's a greater propensity of hypothyroidism rather than hyperthyroidism. We are all talking about what could be the pathophysiological mechanism by, by which hyperthyroidism alters diabetes. <clears throat> now, individuals who've got hyperthyroidism, the half-life of insulin is actually altered. So if you see an untreated patient of Graves' disease, you will see that there is a reduced C-peptide to pro-insulin ratio, suggesting that there is a defect in the pro-insulin processing. That's a very, very key pathophysiological defect that happens. Additionally, there's a problem with the GLUT2, as a result of which there is excess glucose absorption from the gut and poor glucose handling at the hepatocyte. So that's the second point. And there is increased lipolysis, which increases free fatty acid and increases and worsens the glucose control. So all of that, particularly in a milieu of increased glucagon and catecholamines, in a type 1 individual can actually precipitate a diabetic ketoacidosis. So this is one slide where I've actually tried to summarize all of those findings that I've talked about, what the effect of thyroid hormone is on glucose homeostasis. The other issue that I've already talked about, particularly in type 1, which is an autoimmune disorder, you will have other autoimmune diseases associated with this autoimmune type 1 disease including thyroid dysfunction, including other autoimmune polyandrian endocrine cyst syndromes, including particularly type 3. Now, in terms of the genetic factors, it has often been shown that there is co-inheritance of certain genes and HLA factors. So those genes which make you susceptible to type 1, those same genes make you susceptible to autoimmune thyroid disease. So they seem to be transmitted together. So there's a complex co-inheritance of certain genetic factors, particularly of the HLA susceptibility loci. And there is certain complex mechanisms by which this happens. I'm not talking about that. And it's important to remember just one thing, that there are certain candidate genes which are co-inherited if you have autoimmune diabetes, with which you will co-inherit autoimmune thyroid disease. And these are all of those various genes which are implicated in the pathway of thyroid dysfunction in patients with diabetes. Now, I was listening to Dr. Sambit talking on adipokines. This is again very important in hyperthyroidism as well. Now, because there is an alteration in body fat because of excess breakdown of subcutaneous fat and lipid oxidation and peroxidation, there will be increased insulin resistance and increased blood glucose levels in patients with hyperthyroidism. There will be alteration in the leptin, and there will be alteration in the diiodinase enzyme level in patients with hyperthyroidism. The other hormone through which growth hormone works, that is the ghrelin, that too seems to be altered in patients with hyperthyroidism. And we are all aware that the thyroid hormone is essentially required to maintain your basal metabolic rate. Now, the energy expenditure levels might change when your thyroid hormone levels are increased. The basal metabolic rate will change and that will actually change your body stability from energy conservation to energy expenditure leading to excess glucose levels. Now, I've talked about what happens to diabetes as a result of thyroid hormones. Now, what happens to effect of diabetes on thyroid hormones? Now, if somebody has got diabetes and particularly poorly controlled diabetes, there'll be a problem at the level of the hypothalamus and the individual will develop poor response of TSH to TRH and the patient will have a picture of a sick euthyroid syndrome. That means the TSH will be lowish, the T4 will be lowish <coughs> and if the control is very bad, there'll be further lowering of the T3 level. What about metabolic changes in hyperthyroidism? I already highlighted some of those bits <coughs> in some of the previous slides. So this is a summary of what happens if you have thyrotoxicosis on glucose 
homeostasis. One, excess glucose reabsorption. Two, excess hepatic glucose output. Three, excess free fatty acid. And four, excess peripheral utilization. Additionally, there might be beta cell apoptosis, variable effect on insulin secretion, increase in pro-insulin to insulin ratios. And I've already told you about the CQ thyroid syndrome when somebody has diabetes. Now, these are some of the studies to show that if you compare the thyroid function test in a diabetic individual with a non-diabetic individual, you will have lower T3, lower T4 level with possibly slightly higher TSH values. So these might be normal physiological alterations because of diabetes per se. Therefore, don't jump in and treat subclinical hypothyroidism or do not jump in and treat hyperthyroidism. We assess the thyroid function test value very carefully. So these are several of those studies that I've talked about, which kind of show the same kind of results with the prevalence of thyroid dysfunction in subjects with diabetes. Now, one very important thing in hyperthyroidism we need to know is the relationship between HP1C and thyroid function test. Now, we know that in hypothyroidism, the red blood cell turnover is slow. That means the RBC will stay in the system for a longer period of time, as a result of which there will be spuriously raised HB1C level. Similarly, if somebody's got hyperthyroidism, the red blood cell lifespan will be shortened as a result of which the HB1C will be spuriously lower. This is a diabetes care paper which shows that if hypothyroidism is there, the A1C will be falsely raised. We ourselves have actually done a study looking at the effect of thyroid function test on HP1C and showed that this is in line with the diabetes care paper for hypothyroidism. And we have shown that if an individual is hyperthyroid, there will be that kind of an opposite change almost to the tune of 0.4 change in HB1C. So what is you are looking at 7% HB1C in a hyperthyroid individual it might actually be 7.4%. So we've shown that this will again revert once you change or treat the thyroid status. That's very important to remember. Now, a hyperthyroid individual might be because due to Graves' disease, he might have thyroid-associated neuropathy. If such an individual has additionally diabetes, there is greater risk of this thyroid optic neuropathy. So always remember that. Number two, I have told you that the TSH level tends to go up if an individual is hypothyroid. Therefore, the chances of thyroid nodules in those individuals will increase. So also remember of that possibility. And even in type 2 diabetes, there is a greater risk of ketosis if individuals are thyrotoxicosis. What about the medications that we are using in diabetes? What will happen to the thyroid function? For example, if you're using glitazones in a patient with Graves disease with thyroid-associated orbitopathy, there will be worsening. Do not use glitazone in somebody with Graves disease with suspected Graves orbitopathy. If somebody is diabetic, you're prescribing statin. First, make sure that the patient is euthyroid. Otherwise, there will be greater risk of myopathy. And the GLP ones, though shown to have some problem in rodent models, has no problems in humans. Now, what about changes in thyroid function with our renal function test? Because we are always screening our patients for kidney disease. This is one of our studies which suggests that if an individual, if he is hypothyroid, then the serum creatinine will increase and EGFR will decline. You correct the hypothyroidism, the EGFR will improve and creatinine will come down. Similarly, in a hyperthyroid, the renal function might improve. Once you treat the hyperthyroidism, the EGFR might decline. So remember about this interaction as well. <coughs> so this is what happens in the body in terms of hyperthyroidism, straight from the textbook, nothing great about it. Also remember, if an individual has diabetes, 
hyperthyroidism might take longer to diagnose because the T3 and the T4 might actually be lower than what it would have been because of CQ thyroid syndrome and because of certain drugs that the patient is on. <coughs> In terms of the treatment, we would want to aggressively treat hyperthyroidism to improve glycemic control. And you can use either surgery, antithyroid drugs or radioiodine therapy. The antithyroid drugs do not interfere with the glycemic control. In fact, correcting the hyperthyroidism improves glucose control. Now, in some patients of Graves who have orbitopathy, you might have to treat them with corticosteroids. Remember, in such a circumstances, you might have to in use insulin for very tight glycemic control. And remember, when somebody is on a stable dose of anti-diabetic agents and you are treating hyperthyroidism and the hyperthyroidism is improving, you will have to reduce the dose of the anti-diabetic agents. Otherwise, there will be hypoglycemia. So with the improvement of hyperthyroidism, the blood glucose should come down. Similarly, when you are thinking of sudden worsening of blood glucose level in an individual, think of hyperthyroidism, either new onset hyperthyroidism or relapse of hyperthyroidism. One of the causes of ketosis or precipitant of ketosis, I've already told you, is hyperthyroidism. One of the causes of low T3 syndrome is diabetes and hyperglycemia should be re-evaluated all through the course of management of hyperthyroidism. In terms of the take-home, hyperthyroidism can coexist with both type 1 and type 2, more commonly in type 1. There are certain genetic factors which are co-transmitted. Diagnosis can be tricky and difficult. Both need to be managed and controlled and treated simultaneously. Remember, certain drugs might have to be avoided. Remember, there is drug interactions. Remember that we have to treat both of them simultaneously. And also, in terms of the diabetes-related complications, some of the parameters that we actually look at in terms of complications might either be falsely positive or falsely negative. Remember, HbA1c might be falsely low in individuals with hyperthyroidism. Thank you very much. I shall stop there for any questions.